And now our interview with Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, the father of Reaganomics and the former Assistant Treasury Secretary under Ronald Reagan. I'm Paul Craig Roberts. I'm a former Assistant Secretary of the United States Treasury for Economic Policy. I was an associate editor of the Wall Street Journal, a columnist for Business Week, and script Howard News Service. I'm currently a columnist for Creators Syndicate in Los Angeles. I'm a, an academic. I've held positions at Stanford University, Georgetown University, and other places. And the most uh, Im important issues uh, of our time, as I see it, are the loss of the American middle class. Their jobs have been offshored and the remaining jobs are being filled with foreigners brought in on work visas so that we are dismantling the ladders of upward mobility that made the United States an opportunity society and that made uh, differences in income distribution uh, acceptable. Uh, another great uh, problem is that we are we have lost the law, uh, and by that I mean the law that protects the innocent from the power of government, the law that is a shield of the people instead of a weapon in the hands of the state. And when you lose the law, you lose your civil liberties. And, and that means uh, you have lost the Constitution. And another serious problem that we are suffering is the um, collection of uh, power in the executive branch to the exclusion of the legislative and judicial branch. And so we are seeing uh, grow up uh, before our eyes uh, uh, dictatorial powers in the executive branch of the government. So these three are, the, uh, are very serious problems for the United States. They threaten its political stability and the viability of the society itself. The Tyranny of Good Intentions was uh, uh, titled by me, How the Law Was Lost. And it was, and the book is about the destruction of the rights of Englishmen, which we know as the Bill of Rights. The uh, legal principles that protect the innocent that serve as a shield. And we are seeing all of these eroded and the law is becoming a weapon in the hands of the state. And this book uh, documents that for each of the uh, protections among the Bill of Rights. It shows the erosion through uh, prosecutorial abuse, various judicial rulings, and how Americans today do not have the protection of law. Perhaps one of the main uh, contributing factors was that you had all sorts of uh, agendas, uh, you know, single interest agendas, people chasing after devils. We got to do something about drugs. We have to do something about uh, child abuse. Uh, we have to do something about crime. And so they made the mistake that Sir Thomas More uh, warns against in the, in the play, A Man for All Seasons, that if you cut down the law in pursuit of your agenda, so what do you do when the devil turns around on you and you've lost the protection of the law? And that's exactly what has happened. Uh, we had uh, various individual uh, agendas that were deemed to be very important. For example, we have to do something about the mafia. We have to do something about drugs and so on and so on. And so each one of these agendas, by pursuing it, eroded protective features in the law. And, and so the law was lost. The rising police state is uh, already a product of losing the law, of the protective features of the law. That automatically gives you a police state. And in addition, we've had all the fear engendered by 9-11. And this uh, fear was used for an even heavier assault on the uh, Bill of Rights, the assault on habeas corpus. Uh, uh, which uh, prevented uh, indefinite detention without charges. Uh, we've lost that right. Uh, all the due process rights, all the procedural rights that make it possible to enforce uh, civil liberties. You can tell somebody they have a right, but if you take away the procedural mechanisms by which that right's enforced, they don't have the right. 
the erosion of our uh, legal protections began long before uh, 9-11 or the Bush administration. It was already moving along, and that made it easier then for the Bush regime to use 9-11 for an even fiercer assault. And, uh, and that's where we stand today. Generally, when governments get powers, they don't roll them back. And we've not seen the Obama administration uh, roll back any of the uh, powers that Bush and Cheney claimed. Uh, I can remember when the police uh, viewed themselves as the uh, public servants and as protectors of the public. Uh, but uh, in recent decades, uh, the police have been militarized, and they now see the public as the enemy. <laughs> and, and we see this in the uh, enormous uh, number of instances of police brutality toward people, uh, uh, needless brutality. We, you know, we, 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 there'll be beatings, uh, taser people, uh, that, uh, that there's, for which there's no reason. <laughs> And so uh, what does this um, mean? It means that, again, the police agencies of the state, the enforcement agencies, uh, now view the public as an enemy, not as something that, uh, to which they are accountable. So it shows, again, the breakdown in accountability of executive agencies to the people. And, of course, the the police uh, are now probably uh, as dangerous to the public as criminals. And part of it, of course, uh, was unleashed by the breakdown in the protective features of law. Because w when, uh, for budget reasons, you need to solve a lot of crimes or pull in a lot of people, you know, they start planting drugs on people. The, you know, the wide range of police crimes grew so that they could have more and more success in convicting people. So it's, it's now uh, something that's uh, turned um, uh, against the people and perhaps is on the verge of doing so in, in a big way if there's some sort of um, social breakdown. Uh, the police will probably be uh, a danger to the public rather than a than a protector. The Posse Comitatus Act was to be sure that we were never uh, oppressed by the military forces of our own government. And um, if you see that breaking down, then it tells you that the government somehow feels illegitimate or it feels it doesn't have the support of people or that it may be in a position in which it doesn't have support of the people and therefore it would have to rely on coercion in other words, the government doesn't regard itself as answerable to the people. That's the only reason to uh, erode uh, posse comitatus. It means that the government is beginning to think of itself as separate from the people with its own agenda, different from the people's. And, and, and it's a realization that at some point they may have to rely on coercion in order to rule. So that shows again uh, that... Uh, uh, the separation uh, between the people and, and the government. It's not a democratic, uh, it's not an indication of democracy or, or self-rule. It's an indication of uh, government becoming independent of people, as it has been in most countries over most of recorded time. It's, the government is one thing and the people are another. And we see that uh, creeping back in, in in the United States, uh, in, uh, in a gun club in which uh, I'm a member, where we shoot at paper targets. Uh, the police are allowed to use it as a courtesy, and um, the, you know, the local county police. And then others uh, are, are allowed as well. And on some days, uh, there will be uh, 25, 35, 40. Uh, squad cars and uh, uh, scores of, uh, of officers, and uh, they're heavily armed. And uh, it sounds like a war. I mean, they must shoot up uh, thousands and thousands of dollars of, of ammunition. And I've gone there, and uh, they've been there, for example, like three days in a row, just blasting away the same county even, or and I stopped once and I asked myself, uh, what, what are you doing? You 
practicing for some kind of competition. You know, you, you've you got um, uh, some big uh, tournament coming up, and they said, oh, no, we're practicing to, to win the shootout. And I, the shootout, and it was a small mountain-type area, town area. You know, I said, there? <laughs> How you, who are you going to have a shootout with? <laughs> And he said, them terrorists, terrorists. Well, who, who are the terrorists? There'd clearly never be any in that locale. <laughs> and I think they're just preparing to put down any kind of public opposition or protest that, that might arise. And I think that's the reason the police are being militarized. They, they now are equipped by the uh, Department of Defense with military weapons. Some jurisdictions apparently uh, even have helicopter gunships and, and uh, tanks, and they've got uh, rocket-propelled grenades. And it's an amazing ar array of weapons uh, for police, which are essentially supposed to be an investigative force uh, to solve crimes and make a case against uh, whoever committed a crime and present it to the prosecutor. That's what the police are supposed to do. But they're becoming like an occupation force. And, and, and they take, they're, they're undergoing military training with military weapons. This is an enormous departure from the role of police in, in the United States or in any democracy. What, what we can say about the G20 uh, is that uh, it showed two things. One, that the rest of the world is uh, l losing uh, faith in the dollar as reserve currency because this was what was on the minds of, of most of the people there. Whatever the agenda was, the, uh, the real agenda on everyone's mind was the dollar. We, we're holding all our reserves in dollars and you're inflating it away and uh, we have to do something about this. We need some alternative way of settling uh, international transactions. So I think that was an indication that the rest of the world is uh, losing confidence in the, in the United States and in the dollar as a reserve currency. Now, the behavior of the police shows, again, the militarization of the police because they were very aggressive uh, toward people who weren't causing any trouble. And uh, I believe the police were, uh, uh, frankly, disappointed that that there wasn't more trouble for them to beat up on, and so they, on their own, went into neighborhoods with their new uh, weapons or, or protest suppression systems and just sort of arbitrarily uh, abused people. So it's a further indication that uh, the police agencies of the government are now uh, separate from people that they're supposed to protect. It's taken many uh, blows, you know, began probably with uh, Abraham Lincoln and, the, and what's called the Civil War, because this destroyed the notion of a republic and states' rights. And, uh, and, and it took another heavy blow uh, in the, uh, the Depression when, uh, with Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, because that essentially uh, took away the legislative power of Congress. You see, it used to be when Congress passed a law, uh, the law they, they dotted every I, they crossed every T, and the regulatory agencies, that is, there really weren't any, the executive agencies had to enforce the law as Congress wrote it. But during the New Deal, the executive branch gained the power to write the regulations that uh, implement the law. And so, in effect, they gained the power to write the law so that when Congress passes a bill today or a statute, uh, what it really is, is the, it gives the, some executive agency the right to uh, uh, write the law by how it interprets it with its regulations. So Congress has lost essentially its legislative power in, uh, back in the New Deal. And then what we've seen recently with the Bush regime is how Congress just acquiesced time and again into executive claims that it was the superior branch of government and that Congress was there, but it wasn't really uh, on an equal 
basis and that the power of the president exceeded that of the, of the power of the Congress and of the judiciary. So that you had an executive making claims that they were uh, above the law and not bound by the law. And we saw the memos that came from the Department of Justice, John Yu and the others, uh, that basically said the president is not bound by the United States statutory law against torture, and nor is he bound by the Geneva Conventions that we've signed and essentially originated against torture. Uh, he's not bound by the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Act. He can spy on Americans without a warrant, even though the law says he can't. Uh, these kinds of claims elevate um, the uh, president into, uh, into a dictator. And then they use uh, signing statements and, and uh, various executive orders and directives to uh, accumulate more and more power. And uh, it's true, no, no president yet has tried to exercise all these powers at once, but they're there. And uh, any time there's a crisis that they can hide behind to, to use as a justification, then you now have enormous powers that the president can claim that were totally foreign to the Constitution, to the Founding Fathers, and to most of our uh, experience. The American Empire uh, uh, took on new meaning after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union because uh, even though there was uh, a form of empire prior to that, uh, any notion of U.S. hedge enemy was checked by, by the Soviet Union. It was a, a formidable military force, had huge amounts and numbers of nuclear weapons. You know, the Red Army had defeated uh, Germany and and uh, Europe was still terrified. <laughs> so the notion that uh, we had an empire was somewhat different compared to what was possible when the Soviet Union collapsed because we very quickly broke all our agreements that Reagan had made with them and, and uh, began behaving aggressively. And it let the neoconservatives uh, start preaching uh, empire in a new way, and by, by which it, it means to them, U.S. hedge enemy over the whole world, <laughs> you know, that we simply rule the world. And they had not just uh, military justifications for that, but they uh, had these justifications that we are an exceptional people and that uh, we, are, we are the virtuous people. And and so we not only had the right, we had the responsibility, the obligation to impose ourselves on the world. So this, is, this form of empire is new. The, the funny thing about this new empire is it's coinciding with the beginning of large-scale jobs offshoring. So, so while we are telling ourselves, hey, look, we are this new world empire. There's nobody to block us. This, we're sending all the manufacturing jobs to China, all the middle class engineering jobs, the software engineering jobs, the information technology jobs, everything that people were using to, to rise up, and to, you know, to have upward mobility and, and to have a strong middle class, we start destroying that. So, so we are destroying one of the bases for being powerful, just at the same time that we get this notion that we are. Uh, and the same with the dollar. We start then, because of all the offshoring, the trade deficit explodes. You see, if you take production that you're making in the United States and you move it abroad, you've destroyed it here and you've created it to wherever you moved it. It's now Chinese, for example. When it comes back, it's an import. And so the offshoring creates huge trade deficits. Well, what, and that then puts the pressure on the dollar. <laughs> so, so that's the funny thing about this uh, new neocon version of empire. That 
it rose up right while we were destroying the middle class, the manufacturing base, the engineering jobs, the middle class jobs, and the dollar. We were destroying the dollar in the process. Well, the only real reason that uh, we were a superpower was that the dollar is the reserve currency, which means we can pay our bills on our own currency. We don't have to earn enough uh, from exporting. We don't have to earn enough foreign exchange to pay for our imports. So we can run huge uh, trade deficits because we just hand them dollars. We have simultaneously expanded our military adventures, which are also very costly and have to be financed. In fact, you could say essentially that our wars are financed by China. The Chinese, uh, the, the trade surplus that the Chinese have with the United States, if recycled back into the United States, covers the cost of our wars. So how are you a superpower if your foreign creditors can cut you off just by not financing your deficit anymore? <laughs> You've got no way to conduct war. We, we don't have the money to pay for it. The current... Uh, operating budget of the United States government is 50% in the red. I mean, we probably couldn't even pay the president if the Chinese was financing it, or the Japanese, or the, or the uh, Arab oil emirates, Saudi Arabia, the people who have substantial trade surpluses. It's the recycling of those surpluses that finance uh, the government, or that has been financing the government. You know, as we said earlier, the, the annual budget deficit is getting much larger <laughs> than the trade surpluses, so there, real, there is a growing financing problem. So, in that sense, uh, the, the American empire that the neocons had in mind, which was a, a bigger, a different kind of empire than previously, uh, an unchecked empire. Uh, that was undermined even as the ideas were being put into their heads. It was undermined by the loss of the jobs, the manufacturing base, and the beginning of serious erosions on the dollar. You know, on, on December the 3rd of 2009, I think it's the first time in history that one Swiss franc is now worth more than one U.S. dollar. When, when I was a, a young man, uh, there were 4.2 Swiss francs to the dollar. Um, a number of years ago, I guess maybe four or five years ago, um, I predicted at a Brookings Institution conference in Washington that the United States would be a third world country in 20 years. And I think I'm sticking. I think I'm sticking to that. Now, what could we possibly do? Here's a possible scenario to, to solve it. First of all, you would abolish the corporate income tax and not tax corporations on their profits, you would tax them according to where the value is added to their product. If they, if they are producing abroad for, for American markets and the value is, to their product is being added in China, for example, you would have a very high tax rate. But if they are producing in the United States and the value added to their product is in the United States, they'd have a low tax rate. That might offset the huge labor cost advantage uh, of jobs offshoring. It may bring them back while there's still enough knowledge here to <laughs> do the job. Uh, Ralph Gomery has made that proposal and I support it. Uh, and the other thing you would have to do is you would have to save the dollar as reserve currency. And so how can they save the dollar as reserve currency? What they would have to do is get both the trade and the budget deficits under control. 
How could they get the budget deficit under control? Well, obviously they'd have to stop the wars. They'd have to bring back everybody from the 700 military bases. They would have to slash the military budget. We, we don't need a military budget that's as large as the rest of the world put together. We have vast oceans on our east, on our west. We have puppet states on our north and our south. There's nobody can invade us. This, it, it can't happen. <laughs> you know, the Canadians are an American puppet state. The Mexicans are an American puppet state. Uh, nobody, you, you couldn't possibly bring an invading army across the Atlantic or the Pacific. <laughs> it's just not. So we don't have that huge budget for defense. We have it for hegemony. <laughs> and we can't afford the hegemony. It's costing us our, our reserve currency status. So we could get that under control. And the very fact that we uh, change the form of taxation in order to stop offshoring, and then we cut the defense budget, this would show people in the rest of the world that, hey, they are getting their act in place. They're going to save the dollar. Oh, wow, isn't that great? We don't have to worry about it anymore because they don't really know what to do. It's not like there's a, another powerful country there that wants their currency to be the reserve currency. They don't really know what to do. So if we showed uh, sense and intelligence and that we were taking definite steps to get both the trade and budget deficit under control, then the world, I think, would continue supporting the dollar and give us time, it would take years, of course, and give us time to get our act back into balance. You'd have to get the budget back into balance and you'd have to get the trade balance back into balance. And instead of getting the budget that was under control, we've blown it up by four times. It's four times greater this year than last year. Uh, instead of, of, of uh, dealing with the wars and saying, hey, what are we doing this for? We're expanding it. We're putting more troops into Afghanistan. We're putting more pressure on Iran. So we are sending the signals that we're going to continue the extravagance that has put the dollar under so much pressure and, and made it decline in value, even against the Botswana Pula. The United States dollar, uh, over the course of its life, has become a, a fiat currency. Uh, it didn't start out that way. It started out backed uh, by gold uh, and uh, to some extent in different times by silver. And it, it, it uh, therefore was commodity money. It actually uh, could be redeemed in precious metals. Americans could uh, still exchange uh, uh, paper currency for gold and silver uh, in the early part of the 1930s until President Roosevelt uh, made them turn in the gold. And therefore, he took the domestic economy off of gold and made it um, a, a fiat currency, except there were still a few Federal Reserve notes that were silver certificates and, and were backed by silver, and the coinage uh, remained silver. As the uh, fiat part of the currency <laughs> expanded, it put pressure on the ability to maintain a silver coinage, and they got rid of that in 1968. And so that was the last of our silver coinage. They also got rid of the silver certificates that were Federal Reserve notes. And then in the early 70s, um, Nixon uh, ended um, any gold connection to the dollar in international transactions. So between the 30s, the early 30s and the early 70s, Foreigners uh, still had uh, the right to exchange uh, paper dollars for gold. And that was uh, the basis um, on which the dollar became the reserve currency, taking the place of the British pound after World War II. Um, but as the uh, uh, supply of paper dollars grew and grew, 
the rest of the world began to see that uh, they couldn't be converted into gold. And when the French made an effort to convert their holdings of dollars into gold and asked the United States government to uh, um, take the dollars back and give them the gold equivalent, Nixon closed the gold under. And so since the early 70s, there's been no connection between the uh, currency of the United States and, and precious metals. Uh, we still had a copper penny. <laughs> the penny was still <laughs> a commodity money, and that ended uh, in the early years of the Reagan administration. I can still remember the Treasury meeting when they said they were going to take the copper out of the penny, and I protested, and I said, well, you mean it's our, we can't even have an honest penny? <laughs> what kind of country have we become? This is the situation today. It's a paper that can be printed endlessly. And yet there has been a certain amount of discipline. They have not really run the presses because they've been able to finance their budget deficits through issuing bonds and people buy the bonds. And when the American saving rate evaporated, the trading partners of the United States, who had large trade surpluses with the United States, used uh, their trade surpluses to buy the Treasury's bonds. And so the money that uh, we would pay out to them for imports uh, would recycle and come back and finance the, the government's uh, budget. So we've, we haven't really had to print money uh, on the level of, of a banana republic in order to finance the current operating expenditures of the government uh, until uh, recently. It's coming upon us because the, the fiscal year deficit in 2009 is four times larger than the fiscal deficit of 2008. And it's much larger than the trade surpluses of our trading partners. And therefore, there's not enough dollars to recycle, to finance the deficit. And the same thing is uh, occurring in 2010. The, the deficit, again, is huge. And the uh, government itself forecasts it's going to be a trillion dollars a year for the next decade. So that's two and a half times for 10 years the size of the 08 deficit. And the rest of the world doesn't have this kind of uh, uh, surplus savings or, or surplus from their trade with the United States to buy all these bonds. So there's no way to finance them, in my view, except to print the money. One exception would be another decline in the stock market. If the stock market busts again, which it's likely to do, then people fleeing for safety will buy the bonds because that's traditional. I mean, it's habit. It's the way people behave. When they get scared of in stocks, they run and get into government bonds, and they still think the Treasury is a, is a safe place to be. So that could, that could finance a near-term deficit, but that'll only work once because, you know, after the stock market crashes again, it's not likely to have a whole lot of people going back into it. So that's what we face. We face these very large deficits for, for which there's no obvious way of financing them except to create new money. And the way that happens is when the Treasury takes a bond, uh, or, uh, t takes its new debt to auction. Uh, it says, okay, this year we've got X billion, this quarter, we've got X billion of treasuries and submit your bids, and there are not enough bids to take the bonds. Then the Federal Reserve steps in and buys them by creating checking accounts for the Treasury, and that is how they print money. All of a sudden, there's uh, billions, tens of billions of new money created just because the Federal Reserve makes an entry in a book. And it takes the bonds and creates the money to pay for them. Now, when you start doing that, you're telling the whole world that you're printing money. And if 
the whole world is still holding dollars and they see that's going on, they're going to try to get out of them pretty quickly. And as they get out of them, then who's going to buy those? <laughs> they're trying to sell them. Everybody's trying to sell. What happens to the price? The exchange value of the dollars, the price relative to other currencies, and it starts dropping, dropping, dropping. And so who buys them? Uh, the Fed creates more money to redeem the bonds that nobody wants. And this is why some people see hyperinflation in our near to intermediate term future, sometime within the next five years. Once hyperinflation starts, it moves very quickly. And, and if it coincides with high unemployment, you have a crisis that no, we've never experienced. You know, the Great Depression, when everyone was unemployed, you had high unemployment, but prices were stable or falling. <laughs> to have high unemployment and rapidly rising prices, when people have no way of getting income, this is a devastating social situation. It's, it, it, could, it, it has the possibility and the potential of destroying the society and the political order. And um, this receives no attention. They're not giving any attention to this. Uh, apparently, the authorities think that they can create a whole bunch of money uh, to overcome the financial crisis, and then they can step in and take it all back out. So it's a very serious situation and receives no attention, no debate. I mean, talk, I'm talking about from the government authorities. There are no hearings. There's, uh, the financial press avoids it. You could say that uh, Goldman Sachs has run the Treasury since the Clinton administration. You had one Goldman Sachs CEO who was Secretary of the Treasury, and with uh, Bush, you had another Goldman Sachs CEO who was Secretary of the Treasury. And, uh, and now with Obama, we have uh, uh, a protege of Goldman Sachs as Secretary of the Treasury. Um, we have all the uh, uh, testimony about how uh, Goldman Sachs convince the Securities and Exchange Commission not to require the investment banks to, <laughs> to have reserves so that their leverage could, could just go up and up and up. And so you could say, um, who's, who's running <laughs> the policy? Uh, or interest, who, uh, who short-term interest is enriched at the expense of the long-term interest of the country. Now, whether they know that or not, or whether their time horizon is just very short, that, that it's this year's bonus. <laughs> and at all costs. <laughs> and we're a superpower, and we're full of hubris. And everybody will bail us out and do what we want, and why do we have to worry about it? We're getting it now. It, it could be that sort of a mentality, you know. Uh, I don't know. When, when was it that the Romans realized that they were finished? <laughs> you know? When, along the long decline that they went through, did, did it finally, or did they think the whole time it's just some kind of setback? We're the world's power. We're the world's superpower. Nobody can feel an army like ours or supply it, or they don't have administrative systems, these barbarians. Are, can you even maintain a siege on a city because they have no supply apparatus? And they're similar to the kinds of things you hear people say about the United States. Why, you know, we don't have to worry because we're the top dog and blah, blah, blah. So it could just keep people blind. Hubris can blind you. When I sit and think about it and I say, well, you know, we, when we were there, could anything like this have happened? And, and you say no, but again, you know, Reagan was way back. <laughs> things, uh, things change. The United States had a large middle class, and it was possible in the United States for people to rise up, uh, and um, 
and that's how the middle class grew. And it, it was based on good manufacturing jobs, which were high productivity jobs because of the technology and capital with which Americans worked. So they, they produced a lot, so you could pay them a lot. And it was based on education. And we have all these huge numbers of colleges and universities and a very large percentage of people who, uh, who went through university. Now, when you take the jobs that those people used to go into and you move them offshore or you have them uh, fulfilled uh, by foreigners who send in the work over the internet or you discharge your own workforce and bring, on, bring in foreigners on work visas, then you have uh, uh, ended the uh, ability of people to rise. You have uh, destroyed the value of an education because uh, the jobs that people were used to taking are no longer there for them. They've been moved offshore or filled with foreigners on work visas. And so you undermine the strength of your own society. And that's what, uh, what we've done. Now, why did this happen? It's a result of two things. One, the collapse of world socialism. When the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, uh, the whole notion of socialism collapsed. China gave it up. India gave it up. So suddenly, the vast underutilized populations in India and China were available to American capital or any first world capital. Previously, an American company couldn't go into China and produce for the American market. The Chinese wouldn't hear about it, and you couldn't do it in India either. This opened up the extreme uh, numbers of Indians and Chinese to work for American firms. And American firms said, hey, look, if we move from Illinois or Michigan or wherever uh, to China, uh, we, we can hire labor at a tiny fraction of the cost. Plus, we don't have other problems. There's less regulation. The government's not on our back all the time. The unions and blah, blah. So um, the collapse of world socialism was important. The second thing that was important was the rise of the high-speed internet. Because the, the high-speed internet Let's intellectual work, let's engineering work, software work, design work, even uh, radiology. You know, now the hospitals send the CAT scans or the MRIs to India to be read because they do it for $20 and they don't have to uh, pay the, the American trained doctors to, to do this. So all sorts of intellectual work that used to provide uh, good jobs, you know, really comfortable salaries, good careers for Americans can now be uh, done anywhere in the world sent in on the internet. And then the remaining jobs that are still here, <laughs> the corporations have learned they can bring people in on work visas and supplant their own workforce. And, and they don't have any obligations to these people on work visas. They don't have any pension obligations. They don't have any career obligations. And so uh, it's, a, it's a way to greatly increase the profits of firms by minimizing labor costs. So that's what made it possible. Now, what pushed for it? Well, Wall Street. Wall Street uh, pushed the firms to... Uh, enhance shareholder value, that is, to drive up the share price. <laughs> and you drive up the share price by driving up profits, and you drive up profits by driving down labor costs. And so the pressure from Wall Street on firms and also from takeovers, uh, there are all sorts of shareholder uh, activists who would descend on a firm and say, uh, we can run this firm better than the current management. Uh, uh, we're going to vo vote for us. Take us, make us the management, get rid of the old management. We're going to do better. That's another reason for them to move their production offshore, because profits go up. And then you had uh, Congress, which in its great unwisdom, passed a law that it, 
that an executive of a corporation, uh, their pay, their salary was capped at a million dollars a year. And if you paid them more than that, you, it could not be treated uh, as a business expense and deducted from profits unless it was uh, performance-based. And performance-based, again, means did the profits go up. So the whole system then gave the incentive to the managers to move as much offshore as possible. And once it started, of course, Walmart then told all of its suppliers, meet the Chinese price. These are the things that uh, uh, it destroyed the prospects for the middle class. And of course, by taking away the value of an education, uh, you know, sooner or later people are going to realize, what am I paying all these tens of thousands of dollars for an education when I get a job as a waitress or a bartender or, <laughs> or, or temp or hospital orderly? Or uh, this doesn't make sense. How am I going to pay off these student loans? What is what is going on? So at some point, when this realization hits, they won't, the, the universities won't have any clients because uh, you, you can't get anywhere. Uh, there are all sorts of software engineers and just, they come out, they get graduated, and there's no jobs. They're just, there's nowhere for them to work because the jobs are offshore or they're, or they're filled and, uh, and, the, and the work comes in on the internet. This is a very serious thing. It's very, how do you save the middle class when the jobs that they occupied are dwindling? I think Pat Buchanan uh, was right that NAFTA and all that was simply a way for um, the uh, large American companies to dump their American workforces. And, and all the responsibilities that, that came with them and to rely on foreigners. It also, of course, broke the unions. I mean, the unions were essentially wiped out because the industrial jobs are gone. So um, there were probably many motives of that sort behind it. And it shows the inability for government or leaders to and even those who are serving their own interests to realize what the unintended consequences are of what they're doing. See, in the end, all of this destroys the American market for the offshore goods. Because when you lay off your workers and you make the goods with, say, Chinese, and you bring them back in here to sell them to people, well, the workers are laid off. Where they got any money? <laughs> when you divorce um, a significant percentage of your population, if you divorce their incomes from the production of the goods and services that they consume, they can't buy them. The net effect, you know, over the longer period of time of what these people have done, the corporations, the government, is to destroy the American consumer market. And this can get destroyed even faster if the dollar loses the reserve currency because then its value declines even more dramatically against the other currencies. And so the import prices go way up. <laughs> you see, we're always bidding up on China. Why? You've got your currency undervalued. Raise the value of your currency. Well, is that what you want to tell somebody that you're heavily dependent on imports from China? Push up your prices. You see, there'll come a time when Americans walk into Walmart and they think they've walked into Neiman Marcus. It, you see what I'm saying? You, you, the, the minute the dollar declines to the Chinese currency, wow, prices are going to rise. People don't have incomes are already. How are they going to pay these prices? So just the complete absurdity of the whole thing. I mean, it's really an absurd situation that we have gotten in, and it shows a complete failure of leadership, politically, intellectually, business-wise, 
and the people themselves. They just they don't pay any attention. Who knows about this? It's the laid off people who know about it. The ones who are laid off. Everybody else is somewhere else. They, how bad can it get? It can get worse. And, and it will get worse. And it's also the reason why the traditional stimulus programs to deal with unemployment don't work. You see, in the post-war, post-World War II period, recessions were generally engineered by the Federal Reserve in order to cool down labor demands for high wages and, 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 and because they thought that was inflationary and they would, any time the economy got booming, they'd just turn off the money, cause a recession, let things cool down, then they'd start the money back and things would pick back up. Well, the jobs were still there. So the factories could call the workers back to work. But the jobs aren't there anymore. So to say, hey, here's easy credit. Here's, look, we've got historically low interest rates. We've got historically high budget deficits. Both of these things are considered to be major stim stimuli to the economy. And yet nothing's happening. <laughs> Nothing is happening. And why? Because the jobs aren't there. Certainly over the course of its history, the Federal Reserve has caused a lot of problems. For example, right after it was created, it caused the Great Depression. It didn't do it on purpose, but it failed in its responsibility to be the lender of last resort to the banks. And when the banks uh, were failing because of runs on the banks and the inability to call in loans fast enough to pay off depositors. Uh, the, the, it was a responsibility of the Federal Reserve to, be sh to get up carloads of cash and rush over to the bank and deliver it so they could pay off the customers and stop the runs. And, and as the banks failed, the money supply shrank. You know, every time a bank fail in those days. There was no FDIC, no guaranteed deposits. So when a bank failed, the money supply shrank by the amount of the deposits in the bank. So there were a lot of bank failures, so the money supply was shrinking. And uh, the Federal Reserve did take uh, expansionary actions. They just never took them enough to offset the shrinkage. Uh, they misjudged or they didn't know what they were doing or something. But the net effect was the supply money shrank, you know, a quarter by 25%, by a third. Well, if the supply money shrinks, you can't maintain the same level of purchases and employment. And so when you shrink the supply money, you shrink sales, you shrink employment, you get unemployment, you get... Uh, falling uh, gross national product, and that's what happened. And the entire decade of the 30s was troubles, serious troubles for people whose whole lives were disrupted. And it was because the Fed failed to do what it was established for. Now, so either this means that... Uh, there's not enough competence to go with the power. <laughs> and, or there's not enough accountability to be sure that they're doing the right thing. Maybe they're too independent. Maybe there needs to be uh, additional levels of oversight so that these kinds of mistakes don't happen. And since uh, the end of World War II, we've had the opposite problem. Uh, instead of shrinking the money supply, they've let it grow too fast. And so we've had inflation. There's enormous inflation over my lifetime. Enormous. And that means the Federal Reserve is conducting policy inappropriately. They're not, they weren't established to create inflation. You see, if you've got 
three, four, five, six percent inflation year after year after year. It compounds, and the value of the dollars ends up worthless. You can be very critical of the Fed. You can say it's done far more harm than than good. The reason they made it independent was they didn't trust the government not to manipulate it. But you can't trust the government, that's for sure, but you can't trust anybody with unaccountable power. So it, you have the same problem. <laughs> and I think what it really comes down to is anytime you have unaccountable power, then you have a greater range for misbehavior, a greater range for mistakes that go unrecognized and uncorrected. And this is a, a cost for, for the system. And it becomes an even greater cost if the currency is a fiat currency that itself is not limited by some amount of uh, of precious metal, gold or silver, or limited in some way, when when the when the currency becomes essentially uh, unlimited by anything <laughs> except the uh, need to print it, it's clear the tremendous amount of bank reserves that they've created are not finding their way from the banks into an expansion of the money supply. It's simply they're sitting on the reserves. But if the Fed's creating money in another way, which is printing it so the government can pay its bills, then that money is sooner or later got to find its way into prices. And the more unemployment there is, the quicker it'll find its way into prices because there's less goods to absorb the money. So it drives them up. The Federal Reserve published in uh, April of 2008 that the existing money supply, by which they meant currency in circulation and checking accounts, was uh, 1.4 trillion. That was the money supply in spring of 08. Now, the budget deficit in 09, a year later, is 1.4 trillion. If they have to, if they had to print 1.4 trillion to pay that deficit, the money supply would have doubled in one year. Right? Next year, they say the deficit is going to be 1.4 trillion. If they had to print the money in 2010 to cover the budget deficit, the money supply would have tripled in two years. If something like this happens, that they have to print these huge sums of money, inflation is going to start up. And look at the enormous reserves in the banking system that are there to be drawn on to fuel the inflation. Once prices start rising, then if real estate prices go up, then people's homes are out of trouble. That's one way to get rid of the real estate crisis is to inflate away the value of the mortgage debt. Once that starts, the banks will be lending everywhere. And so you would have a tremendous ability for a massive inflation and a long-lived one. And how would you stop it? The only way that these things have ever been stopped is that they... They just say, okay, that currency no longer exists. We're creating a new one. One new dollar is equal to 100 trillion old dollars. These are all implications of what is going on. And when the implications of what you're doing are so dire, you should stop. <laughs> and But we don't. We don't stop. The Afghan war, at a minimum... It's just an out-of-pocket expenses. It's $100 billion a year. Now, if you then count the uh, incurred medical care for the troops for the rest of their life, you 
the cost of replacing all the equipment that gets blown up, the loss of $100 billion of resources for better uses, the cost of the war is huge. We can't, we're not in a position we can afford any such war. Particularly we have to, when we have to borrow it and then pay the interest on $100 billion to the Chinese. It's not sensible. And the things that we do are not sensible. I can't think of anything that the United States government does that's sensible. I can't think of any policy that's working. Remember, lovers of liberty, these video interviews have all been exclusive, and they're going to be archived at prisonplanet.tv. Please download them, burn them to disk, and give them to everyone you know. Upload them to YouTube. This information is vital not just to our free republic, but to the future of free humanity.